Well, the, um, the first key point here is, would we expect, so what we want to do now is figure out the uh, flux through this surface. Well, would we expect the electric field to be changing or constant over this surface? Say, if we compare these two points, would we expect these to have the same magnitude of the electric field or different magnitudes of the electric field? I think the same. Yeah, you'd expect it to be the same because they're both symmetrical with respect to here. They're both the same distance from here. Yeah. There's, there's really no reason why the electric field should be bigger over here than over here because they're all the same distance from the source. That was the whole reason why it was a good idea to draw a sphere. That's why it was bad a second ago when I tried drawing a box. Mm -hmm. A box with different points in the box would be different distances from the source. Yeah. These are all the same distance, so all their electric fields have the same magnitude. What about their directions? Why don't you try drawing the electric field vectors around this source? What would the electric field vectors look like around this source? Let's say that it's a positive source charge. Um, they'd all be leaving. Yeah. So all the electric field vectors look like this. It's arbitrary how many we draw here, but they'd all be pointing out like this. So they all have different directions, but they should all have the same magnitude at every point here on the sphere. So the magnitude of E here is constant. So how can we simplify this formula? Um, we can pull E out and take the integral of dA. Yeah, and what do we get, what do we get when we take the integral of all the dA's? As we already said earlier, when E is constant, this formula reduces to this formula. Well, now you can see why it was so important to draw a symmetrical Gaussian surface. If we don't draw a clever surface, we're not going to be able to simplify this formula and we'll be stuck with a complicated integral. Yeah. So this formula is always true, even if your surface is not symmetrical. This would be true for any surface, but it's only useful for a symmetrical surface. This is only a useful formula for a symmetrical surface where we can take the E out and then simplify this formula. So part of the skill here is getting the right surface. Um, and now, um, what component of each of these electric field vectors is perpendicular to the surface? Um, so would we say that the entire field is perpendicular to the surface, or only one component is perpendicular to the surface, or would we say that none of it is perpendicular to the surface? The entire field? Yeah. I, again, my picture here isn't very good. Yeah. But these should all, um, all of these lines here, since they're all extending from the center here, all of these would be extending perpendicular to the surface or parallel to the normal to the surface. So we don't need to worry about taking that cosine theta deal because um, theta here in all these cases, the angle between each of these and the normal would be zero. Um, so we don't need to worry about cosine theta. I said earlier, that's usually going to drop out. So this formula just reduces to E times A. Well, let's uh, try plugging in a little bit more. Now remember, E is what we're trying to figure out. The whole point here is to figure out E. So we're not going to plug in for that. What does A here represent? Well, A is the surface area of this Gaussian surface. It's not the surface area of the charges. It's the surface area of the Gaussian surface. It would be easy to find the wrong area here. So that means that we have to look up the surface area of the sphere. Uh, you might not have that memorized, but do you think the surface area of the sphere should depend on the radius, the radius squared, or the radius cubed? Radius cubed. Now this is an area. Oh, oh sorry. Um, the surface area would be the radius squared. Yeah, since it's an area, it should depend on the radius squared. Yeah. Uh, but there might be some constants there as well. Do you happen to remember what that formula is? Most people don't remember that, so we can look that up. Yeah. Um, you have your textbook? All right, well, this would be a good time to notice that your textbook has a mathematical appendix. So let's go to the mathematical appendix at the back of the textbook. Here we go. Oh, yeah, mathematical appendix. That looks good. Yeah, here at the beginning of your mathematical appendix. So this is useful when you're doing your homework. You should keep in mind there's a bunch of useful mathematical formulas here in the back of your textbook. 
a bunch of different areas and volumes. So here we have 4 pi r squared. That's the surface area of a sphere. This is where it's very important to remember this is not just a circle, it's a whole sphere, even though I can't draw the whole sphere. We don't want to just take the circumference here. We want to find surface area of a sphere. Now, what does this r represent? Um, does it represent the, um, this r, or does it represent this r? This one, yeah. Uh, again, um, we want, because we want to find the area of this Gaussian surface. The one thing that ha messes people up at this point is there tend to be problems with lots of R's, and people get confused between all the R's. We tend to use a capital R for the, ch for the charges, for the object, and we use a lowercase r to indicate the points in space that we're focusing on. Well, here we need the lowercase r for the points in space, but there might be other times where we need the capital R. So you just have to be very clear in your mind what you're using the capital R for and what you're using the lowercase r for and when you need each of these. Well, here we want the area of the surface, so we want the r that represents the distance between the center of the sphere and the surface. Okay, and what should our Q enclosed be? Our Q enclosed is the uniform charge. Yeah, just our capital Q yeah. over here because this entire capital Q is enclosed yeah. inside of here. So we get this formula. Well, let's just solve this for E. That would give us this formula. Now, by the way, if you think about it, this actually is a formula we had on the board a, couple, a while ago. This was also the formula for a point charge. Um, it looks a little bit different from a point charge because it doesn't have K in it. But remember, we could rewrite this. Right. Remember that k equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. k equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. So it turns out that um, a ball of charge gives you the same formula as a point charge, okay. as long as you're outside of the ball of charge. Okay. So we've kind of um, extended now the point charge formula. It works not just for point charges, but for um, any type of spherical symmetry. Before I forget, this integral is usually written like this, with a little circle. Um, this circle just indicates that we're integrating over a closed surface. So that's just a technicality, but instructors will write this like this to show that we're integrating over the closed Gaussian surface. Okay, so now we've started doing a good job of answering this question. So notice the key here is pick a point in space where you're trying to find the electric field and draw a symmetrical Gaussian surface through it, something that's symmetrical with respect to the source charges. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you won't be able to take E out of the integral. I think it's a good habit to maybe draw the object with a solid line and the Gaussian surface with a dashed line, so we don't get those two things confused. And be very careful always about whether you're using your uppercase or lowercase r. Now, if you think about it, we haven't answered the whole question. We've only found the electric field for points that are outside of the sphere. But the question told us to find the electric field at all points. So now we also have to do, say, the electric field at this point. We have to figure out how big the electric field would be at this point on the inside. Well, now R would be this. This is, again, so remember, you notice we're still using capital R for the entire ball and lowercase r for the point in space that we're focusing on. Now we have to go through this process all over again. Now, again, we have to draw a Gaussian surface through here. Well, the symmetrical surface to draw here is still a sphere. We're still going to draw a sphere. Now, would you expect the electric field to be changing or constant along this sphere? still should be constant. Mm -hmm. So we can still take the E out of the formula, and it's still going to be emerging perpendicular to the sphere. So we get a formula that looks pretty similar. E is what we're trying to figure out. Now, how can I figure out capital A here? Um, 
Yeah, it's really the same as before. We still have the surface area of the sphere. And again, we have to use lowercase r because we're trying to figure out the area of the Gaussian surface, not the whole ball of charge. 